With a view to the blessing and guidance of God, then let's turn to the passage of Scripture which we read, the Gospel according to John and chapter 6. And right at the end of the chapter, the question and answer which we have from verses 67 through to 69. In verse 67, Jesus says to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So verse 67, do you also want to go away? And the answer, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you also want to go away? That's a very solemn and searching question. When it comes from the lips of Christ, and it's addressed to you, as someone who follows him. After all, that's how the disciples heard it. And Christ asked this question after he had preached in the synagogue. It wasn't a Sabbath day when the people usually gathered for their worship services just as we do. It was one of the meetings that they would hold throughout the week. It wasn't unusual to have a meeting for prayer or a meeting for some kind of instruction. Most of the ancient Jews tell us that they would have such meetings perhaps twice a week. And it seems to be on a night like that, when the Lord is gathered with so many people crammed into the synagogue in Capernaum, probably the largest synagogue in the whole of Galilee. And as Jesus preaches, he preaches on the theme of himself, as the bread of life. I've no doubt that he's referring during his sermon to the incident in the book of Exodus when God gave bread in the form of manna for the people to eat. And all that had a special relevance because just the day before this Christ had performed the miracle of multiplying the loaves and the fishes. Now like every other miracle that one was a preaching sign. And he went on to explain essentially what it meant. The giving of bread and the multiplying of bread had something to do with the life and the abundance, the multiplication of life that there was to be found in himself. And he relates this to the experience of Israel in the wilderness when they hungered and God sent manna from heaven which typified Himself, the manna is a type of Christ as he comes to us in his word. Now normally a sermon in the synagogue would be heard without interruption. But in fact that turned out to be quite unusual in the latter stages of Christ's ministry simply because of the content of what he had to say. Very often it was so unusual, so unexpected, and so unpalatable to the people who heard it, that murmuring would break out in the congregation. There was evident murmuring here, some of them saying, how could this man have come from heaven? Don't we know Joseph? Don't we know Mary, his brothers and his sisters? What does he mean by giving us his flesh to eat and giving us his blood to drink? And the ripple of murmuring becomes a swell of discontent, even a brooding, seething anger, and eventually the people just simply walk out. Hundreds of them, led no doubt by the chief amongst them, but out they go, one after the other, until the Lord seems to be left with only the twelve. Now it's hard for you and to me and me to imagine the kind of shock that was for the disciples. It really is, because we just read these things, and it's hard for us to put ourselves into the situation. 
But you must try and imagine the sense of shock. This is an open, visible rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the part of hundreds of people who only the day before had hung on every word and who watched him perform a miracle and actually wanted to physically crown him as king and were disappointed, bitterly disappointed, that he wouldn't accept the crown there and then. Within a day, that had changed to an open rejection. From that day, we're told, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. A shock to these disciples. But if that shocked them, I think the question Christ shocked them, Christ does shock them even more. Because he turns around and asks them simply, You also, do you want to go away? It's easy again to misunderstand the question. It's easy to conceive of a man who feels rejected and who feels suddenly alone. It's easy to imagine a man who says, are you really going to leave me alone? As though he's a man who somehow needs support or a man who needs pity. But that's to misunderstand what the Lord is like. He doesn't ask this question from a position of weakness. He doesn't ask it as someone who desperately longs for popularity or who longs for the support of the people. He asks it from a position of strength. He stands up as God and he searches their hearts and he examines their motives. And he says, they have gone because they find my words unpalatable. You, twelve, do you want to go away? That might not have been the question they were expecting. Maybe they expected some immediate kind of consolation or comfort, but the Lord simply tests them too. He tests them. And if you wonder whether it really is a test, there's no doubt when you come to the end of the chapter, that it is a test. After all, Jesus asks, do you want to go away? Peter says, no, because you have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe who you are. And Jesus cuts across him and says, I have chosen you twelve, and I'm telling you now that one of you is a devil. And if anything, that absolutely reinforces the testing aspect of the question in the first place. As though he is saying, who are you? What do you want? What do you want of me? What words do you expect from me? Who am I? Who are you? And when you think about the question like that, and how Christ follows it up, it becomes a very severe trial of faith. Now, it's not unusual for God to test our allegiance like that. There are some startling incidents of it, even in the Old Testament itself. You remember when God wrestled with Jacob. God suddenly said to Jacob, let me go. And then Jacob famously replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You remember when Naomi was at the border coming back to Israel after a long barren sojourn in Moab. She turns to her daughter-in-law, her two daughters-in-law, and she tells them to go back where they came from, back to their people, back to their gods. Why follow me? Why go to Israel, a strange land and a strange people? And one of the girls goes back home having kissed her mother-in-law. Famously, Ruth does not. She knows who she's with. She knows that she doesn't want to go away. She knows the words that Naomi has taught her. She knows the God that Naomi worships. She knows the people to whom she belongs, and she wants to be with her, and to be with those people, to be with her God, to live and die with Naomi, and to live and die with the people of God. 
But God tests her. Go back. Go back to your country. Go back to your gods. And go back to your people. And sometimes, when we least expect it, God asks us exactly the same thing. Do you want to go away also? Now what I want to do with you is really look more closely at the nature of this test and the way in which the disciples passed it. And by God's grace I hope you will pass it too and myself with you. After all, there's no doubt but that being gathered here tonight under the power of this text, God is asking you the same thing. Effectively so. In our gathering, he is asking you the same thing. And by God's grace, you and I should leave, being persuaded tonight, I hope, that we could go nowhere else, because we find in Christ the words of eternal life. And we find in this Jesus the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Now let's, let's look more closely at the test. Will you go away? Now the question implies, it implies that a temptation was present to walk away. Does it not? And that the disciples might have been under the power of that temptation to walk away themselves. No, I believe that temptation was present. I believe that with all my heart. And I think the temptation came through two channels. First of all, there is what you could call peer pressure. Now, we use that expression all the time with reference to our children at school. But you should know as well as I do that peer pressure refers to a lot more than that. We all have peers, and we all get pressure from peers. There's a tremendous power in a crowd and it's hard to stand apart from a crowd. It's hard to swim against a tide of popular opinion. And the disciples would have felt that too. I want you to consider this first of all, that they knew the people very well. The Capernaum synagogue was a large synagogue in a small town. Capernaum was the main town, still small, it had satellite villages scattered around it, like Chorazin, Bethsaida, Cana, Nazareth. If you were from one, you knew the people from the other. And there's no doubt but that these people all knew each other. The disciples knew them. They weren't strangers. They were people they knew very well. Their own kith and kin. After all, the people could say here, the crowd could say, Is not Jesus the son of Joseph and Mary whom we know? Yes, they did. And the disciples especially knew those who were leaders amongst them. You didn't imagine in that synagogue that there weren't rabbis, that there weren't scribes, and that there weren't Pharisees. You didn't imagine that there was no one there older than the disciples. There were a lot of them there who would have taught the disciples things when they were small boys. And it's not easy to go against people like that when they're numbered in their hundreds. It's just not easy. And if you know anything about life, you'll know that yourself. Now God's really challenging the disciples as to whether their allegiance to him means more to them than their allegiance to the people. And how often he does that. Does anyone love father or mother more than me? Does anyone love brother or sister more than me? Then he is not worthy of my kingdom, Jesus says. These are difficult words. And however you explain them, don't explain them away. Very difficult words. And the disciples felt all that power there and then. After all, of all crowds to resist, a religious crowd is the hardest to resist. To know that by stepping out you may be ostracized from the community. 
To know that by not going with the flow, you are going to be a reject in your village as well as a reject elsewhere, none of that is easy. And that in itself is a temptation just to go with the rest. I remember quite a long time ago, one man who took a very important religious decision on the basis that everyone else he knew was taking the same one. That was all. It's not the best ground on which to make a decision. And the fact is that there are people tonight, maybe here, who are outside the kingdom because of peer pressure. That's it. It's what your peers would say. It's the response in the workplace. It's the response in the school. It's the response in the university or in the college. That's keeping you out. And I'll tell you why that's double the pity, friend. Because, as I've mentioned before, hell is a lonely place. It's the one place where you'll get no peer support at all. None. And it's a tragedy if your peers are keeping you out of the kingdom of God. The flip side is that there are some people still connected to the kingdom for peer pressure too. The only reason they're in is because of people. If you could get out without not annoying or hurting somebody, you'd get out. People seldom think about that side of it. Peers can keep you out. Peers can keep you in. It must be Christ who keeps you in. Christ who keeps you in the church. Christ who keeps you following the gospel. And that's the kind of test the Lord is putting before to the disciples here. Do you also want to go away? We read in the Old Testament that the king, Joash, followed the ways of the Lord until the death of his guardian, Jehoiada. And while his guardian, Jehoiada, died, Joash went off and rejected it all. His religion depended on a man, on the presence of a certain individual. Once that individual was gone, the religion went with it. Is that what your faith is like? I hope and pray, no. But it's what some people's faith is like. So the question has to do with peers or Christ. And then again, there was a second channel through which temptation comes. It's not just the force of the crowd and the force of our religious crowd. It's the fact that they had some... I have to be careful how I word it, some kind of sympathy or some understanding of what made them actually leave in the first place. These people were frustrated that Christ would not take a crown. They were frustrated at his refusal to talk in terms of an earthly, physical, political kingdom. In fact, it was becoming more and more plain that Christ was not interested, I speak with reverence, he was not interested in politics at all. It was not his mission. It was not his ministry. Any time people tried to entangle him in, for example, um, a question about taxation or uh, anything of that kind, he just brushed it off. He took people right down to the spiritual principles that were involved and made them deal with that. Who made me a judge, he says, or a divider over you? You remember when the man said, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And Jesus said, who made me a judge over you? I haven't come here to arbitrate on these matters. I haven't come to deal with these things. I want to deal with the problems of the heart. And he says, while I am at it, is there not a problem in your heart that you can sit listening to a sermon and ask me a question about dividing inheritance? Man, he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And then he goes on to tell how the ground of a rich man yielded fruit and so on. So he cuts to the heart all the time. Now the problem is for these people that they don't want that, you see. They want a certain kind of Christ. The problems that creates, doesn't it? When people want a certain kind of Christ. They want a political Christ. They want a Christ who will get rid of the tyranny of Rome. They want a Christ who will be a Messiah, who will take the place of the Caesar, and who will liberate Israel and make her the greatest nation in the world to which every other nation will bring tribute, to which they will bring glory, and so on. 
And when he stands and talks about flesh and blood, and eating his flesh and drinking his blood, when he reduces everything to spiritual dimensions and eternal issues, they don't want to know, you see. Now you would say, well, in what way do the disciples sympathize with that? Well, not with all of it. Of course not. But they themselves are frustrated at the lack of an earthly kingdom. You remember that even before the ascension, the disciples said, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? You remember when they asked that, just before, uh, sorry, before the ascension into glory, they asked that question. After, just after they had recognized who he was as the son of the living God, these, Jesus then began to teach how he must suffer many things and be killed and be crucified. And Peter takes him by the hand and says, this is not how it shall be, he says. It wasn't their expectation of Christ either. They couldn't understand when the people wanted to crown him why he would not receive the crown. They were confused and perplexed. Have, have the dealings of Christ with you ever perplexed or confused yourself? Well, yes. And it's at times like that, perhaps, that you maybe understand others. There's something keeping you that didn't keep them. I'll come to that in a minute. But, you know, usually when someone goes away, you understand why they went away. You'll find something in your own heart that will chime with the reason why they went. And God suddenly bursts in and says, do you want to go away as well? In fact, let me widen it out like that for a minute. Let's take, well, let's say someone you knew well yourself. They ran with you, they followed with you, they professed Christ with you, and now they're a million miles away. Why? Because of the power of a certain sin that they couldn't let go. And eventually they stopped fighting against it. In the end they embraced it more than they ever embraced it to begin with. Completely swallowed up and devoured by it. And you realize that it's the very one you've been struggling with yourself. There, but for the grace of God, go I. That sin, that is your sin too, made them walk away from Christ. It can happen in other things too. Perhaps someone who just drifted away because they became religiously, spiritually cold. Jesus tells us that when tribulation comes, the love of many will wax or will grow cold. And someone walked with you and ran with you, went to meetings with you, went to church with you, and they just froze to death. No, you couldn't rouse them for anything. But you yourself know what it's like for coldness to grip you. You know what it's like for prayerlessness to enter into your heart. You know what it's like to be under the world and to feel little. There, but for the grace of God, go I. They walked away and followed the Lord no more. You too could have done exactly the same thing. Some others have a hard providence. A tragedy or two or three in their lives. And you too have the same thing, and you never expected it. They walked away, and there but for the grace of God go you. You too could have walked away. You know someone else who followed and who ran for a while, but they gave up because they said, my prayers are never answered. And you too know what it's like to have a particular burning prayer and request that God seems oblivious to. They decided that God, if he was there, never heard, and they walked away and followed him no more. And there, but for the grace of God, you go too. Others just thought Christianity was too hard. These people said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And they walked out the door. And some people have said, well, Christianity is too difficult. It demands too much of me. It demands something of me in relation to my family that I can't give. It demands a self-denial on my part. 
It demands certain things on the Sabbath and so on. I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too demanding. And they walk away. You too know the pain. You felt the pain of some kind of division between yourself and your family. As the Lord Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth but a sword. From now on three and one family shall be divided against two and two against three. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Father against son. You know the pain of that. Others have walked away. And there but for the grace of God you go too. You see the thing is whenever these things come to you. Those people who went away and yourself. You all heard a couple of voices. One voice was from the devil. The devil's voice is just curse God and die. As he said to Job. Give it all up and go back where you came from. See that sin that you're struggling with. You love it more than God. So just let go. And don't bother with the charade anymore. Or that coldness in your heart. That's the real you. Any warmth or enthusiasm you had was just a flash in the pan. Give it up and go back to the world from where you came. That hard providence you've got. Would God give that to a real child of faith? Just give up and go away. The unanswered prayer. Why is that there? It's because God isn't real. Or because you're not a Christian. So just give it up and go back where you came from. Self-denial. The reason you're not managing is because you're just not up with it. Or God is just too demanding. Whatever way it comes, the devil says, go back. Go back to the world from which you came. Is the devil saying that to anyone here? Go back to the world from which you came. And there's another voice too. And it's from God. And surprisingly, he's not saying stay where you are. He's asking you a question. Do you want to go? Why is that? Why doesn't God immediately in these situations, when we're confronted with the power of that temptation, why doesn't God just shield us from that temptation and make everything fine straight away? Why does God expose us to it? And not only expose us to it, but seemingly add to it by saying, do you actually want to go away? Well, I think there's a few reasons why God asks us this question. The first is very simply to remind us that we're free to go back any time we like. Now, that may be a shocking thing to think of too, but yeah, you're free to go back any time you like. Freely you came in, freely you can go out. Do you think God wants unwilling Christians in his army? Is God interested in press-ganging and conscription? Does Psalm 110 not tell us that a willing people in the day of power will come? Does he want a collection of Pharisees? Does he want an army of people who are grudgingly carrying some kind of cross that is not real? Does he want people who are unhappy and miserable Christians? No. If your heart is not in it, don't be in it. That's it. If you don't want to be here, don't. That's quite a shocking thing. If you are not for me, you are against me. And again, you see, the Lord doesn't want our allegiance to him to be out of pity or anything like that. As he said on another occasion, he says, I am able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. None of us are indispensable. If we wish to go, there will be another soldier to take our place. Either we are willingly in it, or let's not be in it at all. We are free to go. Now, when the test is that searching, I really want to know, and maybe you do too, how do you withstand it? What's the key to staying? You need to know that. I read a book, it's probably about 15 years ago now, called Exit Interviews. 
It, I don't even know if it's available. I have no recollection even of who published it, but I read it in another country. It was a series of interviews with about 20 to 30 people who had left the Christian faith, asking them why they had left it. And one thing that came out was just how terrible the fallout rate actually is from the Christian church. Now, in one way, it's no surprise it happens, and I'll tell you why. Because a false, spurious, superficial gospel is preached that consists of frothy emotionalism and just doesn't present real Christianity before the people. That kind of gospel brings people in the door easily, but you'll notice that they revolve out of it just as quickly. Now, when people come in and out just like that, you want to know, I hope, what really makes a person stay? What makes your faith a true one? What makes your allegiance to Christ a real one? Well, it's all in the answer, is it not? And of course, when God asks us the question, he asks it with inducements to stay. You know, it's not a temptation God gives us. God doesn't tempt any man. The devil tempts you, curse God and die. God comes with a test which looks similar, but has its inducements to stay. He doesn't even say, go away. He says, do you also want to go away? In fact, God's whole intention here, or Christ's whole intention, is to get the disciples to understand who they are, and to stay where they are. Do you see the difference? He asks the question with a view to get them to stay. Now, you'll notice that the question puts them right inside themselves. Do you want to go away? You can't answer that question quickly. You've got to think. And you've got to be intelligent. And you've got to be spiritual. And Christ is just putting them back into themselves like that. Just as I said earlier, he's making them ask, what am I about? What makes me tick? What's my religion? What's my faith in? You know, if you ask questions like that today, contemporary Christianity will say, ah, you're doubting. You should never doubt, you should believe, and that's that. It's all so trite, and banal, and superficial. There are times when God wants you to get right deep down inside yourself. I think I mentioned that, was it last week in connection with the Lord's table, when one of you shall betray me, and they all asked, is it I? The process was designed to get them all looking inside. Is it me? Could it be? I think I mentioned it in connection with Joshua, and the defeat at Ai, when the whole, the whole of the people were being forced by God to examine themselves and ask if they were the reason for the failure. Well, here the same thing. These are all things getting them to go inside. Self-examination is good. There are times in your life when God will just stop you in your tracks and put you right down inside your own heart and ask yourself fundamental questions. What is Peter's answer? And here I believe he is representing them all. Well, not all, is he? And we're told in the very next verse that one of them is definitely not represented. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? The amazing thing is that Judas still sticks around. This is not enough to put him away. He still sticks it out. He's got some hope that this man will yet still be a political king who will make him rich. Although he's fast losing that particular hope. Well, what is Peter's answer? Verse 68, these are immortal words. Well, literally so. The living word which never dies. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What can we say about that? To whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Well, first it's a statement of faith. It's not a statement of resignation. It's not the statement of someone who says, I've made my bed so I'm going to lie on it. It's not the statement of someone who says, well, I gave up my fishing boat a few years ago and I'm going to look a complete clown if I now make a public declaration that it was a waste of time. It's not someone who says, I've started so I'll finish. 
And I hope that's not the reason you're in church, are you? You're not here because you professed faith five years ago, are you? You're not here because you sat at the Lord's table for the first time ten years ago. Is that why you're in church? No, I hope not. There is something more real and living than that. It wasn't because of a single decisive event of that kind. It wasn't because you just publicly nailed your colours to a mast and it would be too much of a public shame for you to take them back down. No. This is a statement of faith, not resignation. This isn't someone who's going to make the best of a bad job. No. His whole heart is in what he says. You have asked me a searching, searching question. And I am going to give you back what is in my heart. Watching the crowd, listening to what they have to say, I say to you, to whom can we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. In other words, they stay because of what Christ himself means to them as the son of the living God. We have come to believe in who you are and your words seal that to us. They are words of eternal life. You have drawn us by these words. And it's because of these words that we stay with you. Now I want you to notice what the disciples didn't say. They didn't say, we stay with you because no one else could multiply bread and fish like you did yesterday. They didn't say that. They didn't say, we stay with you because you stilled a storm. You silenced the power of the wind and the waves. They didn't say, we stay with you because you make our providence so good and so favorable all the time. They didn't say that either. They said, you have words of eternal life. Notice, that is the bond. That is the point of contact with Christ. That's the cement. That's the glue. That's the spiritual glue that keeps them and Christ together. The word the word which he spoke to them. And that will be true of every single Christian. And you watch anything that comes in between you and the word of God. Any person that comes between you and it, any church that comes between you and it, any human authority, any pastime, any recreation, any bad mood, any feeling, any habit, Anything at all that comes between you and the word, be ruthless with it. Ruthless. Make this your closest companion. Make this the voice that you hear every day. Make this the voice that rings in your ear. Make the songs of this book the songs that go round in your head all the time. Are they? Probably not. But I'll tell you this, that the songs which go round in your head most of the time will be the songs that will gradually form your character. Because every song has the power to be a character forming song. You have the words of eternal life. So watch the bond between yourself and that word. Well then, if the word brings eternal life, or if they are words of eternal life, what does that mean? Well, let me say this to you. First of all, Peter is saying this, that your words, O Lord, speak about eternal life. And so they do. And you see, where God really creates a desire, that desire will be satisfied by that word. They wanted to know about eternal life. That was the burden of their souls. They weren't infatuated with what went on around them like that. They wanted to know about spiritual things and about spiritual life. And because that was their desire, then the words of Christ met that desire. The Lord was so different from others. The scribes, the Pharisees and the rabbis, they could 
They could talk all day long about certain rules and regulations, about tithing certain minute things and what have you. They were experts on tradition. They codified it. They looked to the fathers and they listened to the fathers. And suddenly the Lord was like a breath of fresh air. To anyone who hungered and thirsted after righteousness, to hear a man like this speak with the authority of someone from beyond the veil and the illumination of someone from the other side, to speak as of the father of spiritual things, what your soul needed, that to them was like a cup of cold water in a dry, thirsty land. Good news from a far country. That to them was what the gospel was. You have words that speak of eternal life. You also have words that reveal what eternal life consists of. Others can speak about living on eternally, but they can't tell you what that means. Jesus tells you exactly what it means. John 17, verse 5. This is eternal life to know thee, the Father, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Yes, he came to reveal the Father. The Holy Spirit came too to reveal the Son as well as the Father. That is eternal life. To know God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Through the power of the Word, that is eternal life. To know the fellowship that brings with the people of God, that is eternal life. The words reveal what eternal life consists in. Who would have thought that it consists in coming into the family of God and knowing God personally? That's what salvation is about. Your life, you will walk away unless you have the life of God in your heart. If religion is an empty shell, you will walk away. Unless God lives in you and you live in him, you will walk away. You must make sure that you abide in the vine and that the words of Christ abide in you. Be in the company of living people. Yes, we have to live life. We live it in the world. Fair enough. But find living people. Have company and fellowship with living people. Share your lives with those who share their lives with God. It's in there that you discover eternal life. And then again, mysteriously, the words that Christ spoke... Don't just speak of eternal life or reveal what it consists in, but actually carry the mystery of life into your soul. You even have that here in verse 63, where Jesus says that the words that I speak to you, it is the Spirit, he says, who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. That's marvelous because it was this word coming into your ear that took the life of God into your heart in the first place. You were born with the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And now it is the hearing of that word that nourishes that living creature. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may live thereby. It is hearing this word, speaking and sharing this word, the good news about Christ. That's what nourishes this creature and makes it to grow. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Life. Something comes to you when the word of God comes into your hearing. Is that not true? Psalm 119 reminds you, your statutes, they have quickened me. They have brought me life. And that's even through of the hard things. You know, just preaching about election here and the sovereign choice of God of sinners. That's what turned a lot of the people out the door. This is a hard saying and who can hear it? Aye, it's a hard saying, but we can hear it all right. There are things hard to understand about it, but yes, we can hear it. We'll take it. We'll take anything he says. It is life to our souls. And when Peter says, to whom can we go? Again, he doesn't mean that in the sense of, well, if there was someone else, I'd go there. Again, in other words, he doesn't mean it as, what can we do, you know? May as well stick it out. No. 
He is seriously confronting Christ as Christ has confronted him. Do you want to go away, Peter says? To whom? What we find in you, we don't find anywhere else. The words of eternal life that we find in you and the life that we find with you, we don't find it anywhere else. We'd rather the rocky road, as you lead us on it, in comparison with, well, what we had before. What we have? Well, we had our fishing boats, yes. We had a good business, yes. We had scribes and Pharisees that we went to listen to every single week and were sick fed up of them. As for the fishing and what have you, that's not going to give us eternal life. Where are we going, Peter says. It's not just the case that there's nothing there back in the world, but you have something that is so wonderful that we are not going to let it go. Now believe me, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, the devil will make outside look to be the place to be. Remember Israel and the cucumber and the leeks and the melons and the garlic and so on. And you'll say, why don't you just go back out? You'll say, well, you'll make a better job of it than you did before when you were in the world. Your life's going to come, you know the way he speaks. The problem is that if you're not living close to God, that voice is going to be very strong. You're going to have to learn to live close to God so that you can say, no, 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 I'm not going there. I'm staying where I am. I'm staying with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what Peter said. And so we say too, every good thing we have is bound up with Christ now. Every good thing I've got is bound up with the word of God and I can't do without either. Take Christ off me. Take the word of Christ away and I have nothing left. Shadows. Phantoms. That's all. And that's why I'll just close. I had a couple of other things to say, but again, I've mismanaged my time. But I'll close with what Ruth said. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. A marvellous profession of faith that was. And I hope that's yours. And if someone's been saying to you, go, and if God's been asking you, will you go, you leave tonight saying, no, I will not go. I will stay exactly where I am, because I find in you what nothing and no one else will ever give me. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for all that we have bound up in Christ Jesus, that we find nourishment for our souls there, the very deepest things, fitted for the deepest needs of our own hearts. And we are thankful that whatever we have, there is more to come, and that shall be so into eternity. And so help us to see the emptiness of a Christless world and to see the fullness of a life lived with Christ. And if others should leave and go back, Lord, we pray never to join them. In our Saviour's precious name, Amen.